A date which will live in infamy. Both of those projects, initiatives, got off the ground because of the Gare River. The 11th Olympic team members slain in West Germany. The Olympic Games. So geheiz waren die Brüder in Amerika. So kauft und schaffet es das Gitter. Out of the 24 who were killed were Americans who had come to learn in Kevin. I say one million Jewish children who were made to be cut and who shot. Whoever heard such beautiful words, It is never too little. It is never too late, and it is never enough. Jewish History Soundbites, bringing alive the world of our glorious past. Here is our host, live from Jerusalem, Jewish historian and tour guide, Yehuda Geber. Yehuda Geber with Jewish History Soundbites, and this is a uh, part two, continuation about the history of Lamji Yeshiva. In part one, we discussed... Rabbi Lezer Shalev is the founder of the yeshiva, Rabbi Chil Mordechai Gordon, who was the longtime uh, Rosh Yeshiva in Lamja. We mentioned in passing the move to Petach Tikva, and all of these things are what I want to, would like to elaborate on and continue the story of the Lamja yeshiva now here in part two. The main attraction in the pre-war years, from his appointment in 1912 until his unfortunate passing at the age of 60 at the beginning of World War II, was the legendary Mashgiach of Lamji Yeshiva in Poland, he never was in the Petach Tikva branch, Rabbi Meisher Rosenstein. Um, Rabbi Meisher Rosenstein was the best friends with Rabbi Rucham Levavitz, uh, the famed Mashgiach of Mir, from their days in Kelm. In fact, Rabbi Rucham, who was a bit older than, than Rabbi Meisher Rosenstein, was the one who brought him into the Muslim movement. He drew him in. Um, uh, Ramesh Rosenstein was, grew up in Uzvant, where Rabbi Rucham lived uh, um, for a time after he got married. And they were very, very close. And in an introduction to one of the um, Sfarim of Rabbi Rucham, of his Shmuzin, so there's a whole uh, you know, description of their relationship and stories uh, of, of that they had together. Uh, they were very, very close. And in many ways, Rabbi Rosenstein paralleled Rabbi Rucham's career and influence in just much less well-known. Rabbi Rosenstein was the dominant personality in the Lamji Yeshiva, much more than the Rashi Yeshiva, like Rabbi Rucham was in the Mir. And Rabbi Rosenstein had a very unique approach to Musa and education, uh, again, very different than, when, than what Rabbi Rucham's approach was, but the fact that it was a unique approach to Musa and education uh, was was similar to Rabbi Rocham. Uh, not not every mashgiach had a unique approach to Musa and education. Uh, you had to be, you know, someone like Rabbi Rocham or Rameshu Rosenstein. And uh, Rameshu Rosenstein is one of the uh, not well known, not enough studied um, uh, um, m- members of the Musa movement, the third generation of the Musa movement, uh, uh, right right before the Holocaust. So he grew up and he went to Tal's yeshiva. And then later on, he meets Rabbi Rucham, which, like I said, changed his life. And he went to study in Kelm. And he also studied for one year in the Kail Kudshim of Radin by the Chavetz Chaim. Um, so for a short time, he had an exposure to the Chavetz Chaim as well. And then shortly afterwards, in 1912, he was appointed the Mashgiach of Lamja, where he would remain for the rest of his life. He was completely dedicated to the students' welfare. Uh, some, Many of the students, most of the students loved him. Others, they were resentful of his being so much on top of things and very rigid on discipline. Uh, and some of them didn't appreciate that um, because he was, he was, you know, he, he was the yeshiva. He almost never went home, uh, even though his home was right near the yeshiva. If, if some, you know, pretty wild stories about him only going home on Friday night uh, to make Kiddush and then he would go back to the yeshiva and then during the week he would stay in the yeshiva building the entire day and night, uh, sleeping for a few hours in the base medrash on like a bench or something, a really an incredible uh, personality. Very, He had some 
interesting or, or even strange customs, and by all, account, and all, by all accounts, he was very intense. He was a very intensive personality. He delivered Musr Shmuzin talks to the entire yeshiva a couple of times a week, including Shabbos. Shabbos uh, was one of the times he would deliver a Musr talk. And uh, he almost never slept, like I said. He also had a senior uh, vadim, which was small select groups of senior students who were invited. It was by invitation only, where they worked on specific areas of Musr together. And it was a very, very intense Musr environment which he generated in the Lamji Yeshiva. And he was able to adapt to the Hasidic values and the ideology of his students. I began to mention that in part one. Um, so on one hand, he adapted to the the uh, Hasidic values and needs of his students. On the other hand, he was very outspoken in his opposition of all modernist trends in the yeshiva, any expression of anything modern or any of those ideologies, a very big opposition to general studies, uh, that it should never be in the yeshiva, um, the study of Russian, or later on Polish, um, any outside literature, any anything from the Haskalah movement. Uh, he, very, very... Uh, outspoken about that in his opposition. There was even an incident, a very interesting incident, with um, with with um, Hill Zeitlin, who was a fascinating personality of interwar uh, uh, Polish-Jewish life, uh, someone who grew up religious and distanced himself from that, was a Yiddishist, an intellectual, and then a philosopher, and then later on returned to religious life, but not to mainstream Jewish life. Uh, he was very critical, actually, of of mainstream, and he was someone who kind of balanced both worlds. And he was a very interesting individual. He lived in Warsaw. He was, uh, wrote for for one of the main Yiddish papers, I think, either Heint or Moment. Those are the two big ones. And um, he was a very prominent personality. In fact, I saw uh, recently someone shared with me a a newspaper. Uh, you know, one of the Yiddish uh, papers in Warsaw ran a poll. Among among its readers, uh, who are the ten most popular Jews in Poland, and he reached uh, one of the one of the top ten. He was like third or fourth. I mean, you know, you had the heads of the Bund, you had the Ger Rebbe, the Mrayemes was in the top ten. You had some of the great Zionist leaders of interwar Poland. You had some of the you know writers and 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 thinkers and and stuff like that. You know, the top ten Polish Jews are very interesting. Poll has taken obviously it doesn't reflect the real reality because it, you have to know who the readership of the of that specific newspaper was. Maybe if I ever, I mean, Hill's Island is a great story. So one day, maybe one day we'll have something about Hill's Island and the uh, neo Hasidism uh, before the war and people like that. Um, so of course they got off on a tangent. So he was a famous personality and he visited the yeshiva at one point. And the uh, students of the yeshiva in Lamja were like all excited, and they spoke to him, and it was a whole a whole thing. And the Rebbe Rosenstein was very not happy, and he uh, he gave a shmuz in the yeshiva afterwards about he was upset and the visitor, and he said this visitor may look religious, which he did, um, and uh, but he, but he doesn't share our values, and he really was spoke out very very strongly against him. So uh, you know he he was very very um, you know had a very clear. Uh, educational goals and values that he wanted to impart to his students. He authored Musr works in his own lifetime and had them published, which was also quite unique. Most mashgichim, uh, people collected their shmuz and afterwards and tried to put them together in a sefer. But he himself wrote down his own Musr ideas. He was a great thinker and a deep thinker, and he wrote them as, uh, published them as Yisoyde Hadas, which he himself published, and other svarim. He had quite a few other svarim as well. Uh, and then he had other ones that were prepared in manuscript that he didn't have a chance to publish, and unfortunately they got lost in the Holocaust, so they're uh, lost forever. Um, the influence of Hasidic life and values on his Musr outlook was very, very uh, clear. Uh, and just to give a few examples, um, he made one of the cornerstones of his Musr ideas an emphasis on love of God. Now the classic Musr approach was yira, was awe or fear of God. And uh, this became, this is something that Israel Salander spoke about literally endlessly, Yira. Uh, Musr Sfarim were sometimes referred to as Sifra Yira. And uh, the Musr movement was talked about as a movement of Yira Shemayim, of Yira Hashem, and, and of emphasizing Yira. That, that came to be a defining feature of the movement. Here comes along someone who makes 
one of the great, uh, one of the values that he constantly speaks about and, and emphasizes is, is love, love of God, Ava Hashem, and, uh, and also of Simcha, happiness, and love of others, fellow Jews, and love of fellow others, even non-Jews, and even animals. Imagine that. Imagine a, a Musar Mashgiach, someone as rigid and as intense as he was, and he's speaking constantly about simcha, about happiness and the value of love, not just to fellow Jews, but even of non-Jews, even of animals, and of course the love of God. Uh, so these were in, uh, inherently, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to call them Hasidic values because then I'm going to get a hate, hate mail. What do you mean? They're Jewish values and everyone had them, and of course. And uh, The idea is is that, um, and this is some, you know, important to emphasize in general, in a traditional society a shift in emphasis is revolutionary. Uh, so you don't have to have a new idea to be called new or revolutionary. You have to have a new emphasis of an existing idea because we're in a traditional society. And traditional conservative societies, there's never anything new. There's new emphasis. So the fact that he emphasized these values when within the Muslim movement these values were not being emphasized means that he was different. And that's, uh, that definitely means it was an influence uh, from, you know, like I said, the student body was mostly Has- uh, Hasidic. There was also a part of his thought was Tamimus, simplicity and emuna and faith um, in different directions than, his, uh, than the people who influenced him. Like I said, he studied in Tels, or basically Blach, um, and then his mentor in Musa, Rabbi Rucham Lubavitz, who had a much more deep and sophisticated Musa, and the idea, the, the reaction to that of Ramesh Rosenstein was just the opposite. No, Tamimus, simplicity. Not deep, not sophisticated. And he's in the third generation of the Musser movement and a very important thinker of the movement and uh, often overlooked. Uh, pretty much the only thing ever written about uh, Rabbi Moshe Rosenstein is an article written by Professor Benny Brown, and he's re- researched and written about him. It's an excellent article in summary, so if you're interested in reading more about this very, very interesting personality, you can uh, refer to it there. I think he published it in two places. I know of the ones in Hebrew. I don't know if it's ever been translated. It could be it is. Um, he also, um, Ramesha Rosenstein also discussed tradition and emphasized its importance while dealing sharp and consistent criticism to modernity, to its ideas and the challenges of modernity and all the new ideologies. And if it's new and it's a new ideology, then inherently it's false because tradition is always true and the uh, very, very conservative values. So anything new is false because it's new. And uh, almost like the uh, Hasim Seifer, almost like the Hungarian uh, ideas that uh, here we have it in the middle of the Musser movement, which he was the only one expressing them. And some of those ideas have become mainstream post-war and they could either be attributed to the Hasim Seifer, but maybe the seeds were already planted within the Lithuanian Torah world by people like Ramesha Rosenstein. So that you have that there as well. Ramesha Rosenstein uh, passes away at the beginning of the war in 1941. Um, so it's right, right, uh, right before, you know, Everything, everything goes bad. It's already you know a year and a half into the war. Um, he's the age of sixty. You know, passed away quite suddenly. Um, and then uh, the Lamji Yeshiva, going back to where he was the Mashkiach, uh, is led by at this point by Rabbi Shua Zelig Roch, the Rosh Yeshiva. And then uh, so this Rabbi Shua Zelig Roch and most of the other Yeshiva rabbis and their families and most of the Lamji Yeshiva students are all killed in the Holocaust. Um, and so that 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 whole you know that that whole uh, that whole story kind of comes to a tragic end over there. Um, but like I mentioned in part one, there was a branch that had moved to Petach Tikva, and the decision was taken in 1926 to follow in the footsteps of Slabatka, which had moved to Hebron a couple of years earlier. And Lamja goes ahead and opens a branch in Petach Tikva in the new Yishuv, which Slabatka had almost done. They had almost gone to the new Yishuv, but in the end they didn't. They went to Hebron. Uh, Lamja actually settles in Petach Tikva in the New Yeshiv in 1926. Uh, they start fundraising for a building. Like I said, Rebichil Mordechai Gordon was involved in that as well at this stage. And um, in 1930, the new building was dedicated in a very impressive ceremony. It was attended by both chief rabbis at the time, Rabbi Avram Yitzchak Kakayin Cook, and the Sephardic chief rabbi, Rabbi Meir Ben Sin Chai Uziel, who these two were of the greatest uh, rabbinical uh, figures in the mand- British Mandatory Palestine, and they both attended the ceremony. Uh, Lamja Petach was, was housed in an impressive building, very beautiful and imposing structure. The, uh, 
building still exists. It's still, uh, like I said in part one, it was still used as a coil afterwards by the, uh, until the recent passing, I'm sorry, it was led until the recent passing of the uh, Reish Kail, Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Eliezer Oizer, um, and I believe the Kail still exists. It's on uh, Rehov Herzl in uh, Petach Tikva. And this became, this Lamja of Petach Tikva became the main Lithuanian style yeshiva of the new yeshiv. Later on, you had, after the Hebron massacre, so Hebron yeshiva kind of split. Um, the younger group went uh, to Yerushalayim. It was led by Rabbi Chatzko Sarna, and they established the Hebron yeshiva in Yerushalayim, in Geula, in that neighborhood. And then the older students of Hebron, they established a, a branch, was essentially of Hebron Slabatka, they established in Tel Aviv, which came to be known as Heichal HaTalmud. Um, so you had a Lithuanian style yeshiva in the new yeshiv in Heichal HaTalmud, but it wasn't as successful. It was for, for older, it was kind of a kailal, and uh, see, so you, you had that, it didn't have as much of an impact as Lamja did. You also had Navardic, which came to to uh, Palestine as well. They're, they're the third uh, Lithuanian style yeshiva to make the transfer. Reb Hill Vitkind opens a Navardic branch in Tel Aviv, and then you had Reb Matasio Shtitzkal opens a Navardic branch in the very new settlement of Bnei Brak, uh, but they also weren't as successful. And then you had Hebron in Yerushalayim. But the in the new yeshiv, you had the, the biggest game in town, the biggest show in town was Lamja Petach Tikva. And although today it does not appear as the main yeshiva in, uh, in, in Israel today, but at that time it was the place. It was, uh, and, and Reblazer Shalevitz in his last years was involved in building it up. And then uh, later on, the ra- rabbi of Petach Tikva, who I'll get to in a second, or Katz, Katz, was, uh, was involved with the yeshiva as well. Uh, and then they also had, they had hired one of the, uh, the, the most famous uh, mashgiach, Meshgichim alive at the time, of Chatzke Levenstein, to become the Meshgich, and that really also put it on the map, even though it was for a very short time. Reb Chatzke Levenstein was living in the Mir um, in the last years that he lived in Europe, uh, before he moved to Petach Tikva. He did not have an official position in the Mir at that point. Earlier on he did, and uh, it was Rabbi Rucham came back, he had not been there for a period of time after World War One, and then he came back, and Reb Chatzel kind of stayed, and he didn't have an official position anymore once Reb Yeruchim was there. So he, he kept a low profile. He had a, he had a, you know, he, you know, he gave some Musar Vadim in his home. But he, you know, he, as soon as the, the Lamji Yeshiva and Petah Tikva opened and the position opened, so he was offered for the position. He moves to Palestine, Palestine, and he becomes the Mashkiach there in the 1930s. Uh, what happens is, is that shortly afterwards, Rabbi Yerucham Lovavitz in the mirror passed away. 1936, the summer of 1936. And there was a whole big to-do about who would succeed Rabbi Yerucham Lovavitz as Mashgiach in the mirror, without getting into the whole story and details. And Rabbi Chatzka Levenstein was eventually hired as a compromise candidate, which very often happens in politics, but it also happens in yeshivas. Occasionally a compromise candidate has to be brought in. And it's, he's, Reb Chatzkel Levenstein is brought in to fill his place. It was supposed to be temporary. Reb Chatzkel had moved to Palestine, to the land of Israel. And he had a position in Lamja. So Reb Chatzkel saw it as temporary. He was planning on returning to Lamja. But then World War II intervened a few years later. And of course, the rest is history. Reb Chatzkel went with him to Shanghai and then to the United States until he finally comes back to Israel. And by then, it wasn't relevant for him to go back to, uh, to Lamja. Um, I remember when I was... Uh, a single student in the Mir Yeshiva. So on Tisha B'Av every year, Reb Chatzik Levenstein's grandson, um, Reb Lazer Ginsberg, um, would come and spend Tisha B'Av in the Yeshiva. He was, the rest of the year he was in, in Brooklyn, but he, he would spend the Tisha B'Av in, in Israel and he would address us in English on Tisha B'Av night in the Mir. And, uh, and he, would, he would go on for a long time in a very loud voice and very inspiring and very long speech. Every Tisha B'Av night I went for years. He went on, the energy that he had, it was incredible. Either way, so what I'm getting to is that he, uh, he used to say stories sometimes about his grandfather and sometimes they're about his time in Lamja. Um, and it's funny, you know, it's, it's interesting because Reb Chatzel did not have, was not there for the very long. So I always wondered about that period of time in, in Reb Chatzel's life. And I remember he was saying a story about how he wanted, uh, again, this was a new phenomenon. This was a Lithuanian style yeshiva in the new yeshiv. 
and uh, he was trying to set uh, Kelm and Mir standards here for this new yeshiva. And he wanted them to walk around with the proper attire of a yeshiva student, with a hat and a jacket. And he would say, uh, he would say, it would influ- it influences. It has a metaphysical influence, uh, maybe even a practical influence on the surroundings. He said, when when the yeshiva students in in Petach Tikva do not have the proper attire, so in Tel Aviv they have the the uh, you know the secular Jews in Tel Aviv have even less an appropriate attire because there is a spiritual influence that the yeshiva students have, and that's what what, what Reb Lezer Grinsberg would, would cite from his grandfather Reb Chatzkel about uh, how the, he would encourage them to have the proper dress. The reason it sticks in my memory so much is because I think it's the only time in my life I ever heard someone refer to that city as Pesach Tikva. I always referred to it as Petach Tikva. But when Blazer Ginsburg was uh, yelling on Shavuos night, uh, excuse me, on, on Tisha B'Av night, uh, this story about his grandfather, Reb Chatzkel, he said it in Pesach Tikva. So that was an interesting uh, way of referring to the city. It's ironic that Reb Chatzkel Levenstein, Reb Shmuel Rozovsky, and Reb Lazar Menachem Shach were all Rebbeim or Mashgichim in Lamja Petach Tikva at different times, and subsequently they became famous for their position, their career in Panovish Yeshiva, which is the place which kind of usurped uh, Lamja's position as the premier Lithuanian style Yeshiva in the new Yeshiva. Panovish kind of took that place. And not only did they take their place and become the prominent Yeshiva, but they also took all their Rebbeim. Reb Chatzkel eventually was the Meshkiach in Panovish, Shmuel Rozovsky was eventually the Rosh in Panovich, and so was Rosh Shach later on also. So I'd say, very interesting quirk of history. Uh, Reb Ruvain Katz, like I said, was the rabbi of, of um, Petach Tikva for many years, um, and he also was uh, involved in the issue, very actively involved in the issue, much more than most communal rabbis were. So it's also a very interesting story. He was a fascinating individual. He was a member of the very famous Yad HaChazaka, the 14 students who were sent from Slabatka to found the yeshiva in Slutsk, the Brzezalma Meltzer in 1897, at the behest of the Ridbaz, or it's it's, it's Volovsky, the the uh, the uh, rabbi in Slutsk. So um, so he was one of those elite 14 students, or Ruvain Katz, and um, he authored many uh, books called the Degel Ruvain, and he was a rabbi in Poland, in a few towns in Poland, and later on he immigrated to the United States, in the late 1920s, and he was a rabbi in New Jersey for a few years, and then he immigrates to Palestine in the early 1930s, and he was a rabbi in Petach Tikva for the last 30, three decades of his life, last 30 years, 19, excuse me, 1932 to 1963, and he also oversaw the, um, excuse me, the activities of Lamji Yeshiva in that capacity. But the day-to-day running of the yeshiva as the Rosh Yeshiva was Ramesh Leib Eiser, uh, like I uh, like I mentioned, and who was the son-in-law of Rebbeis Shulevitz, the founder of Lamja in Poland, and until his passing in the 1960s. Um, interesting, like I said, how it was the premier yeshiva. So I want to illustrate how it was the premier yeshiva by the products that the Lamja yeshiva and Petach Tikva produced over the years. Um, you had Rebbeis Shmuel Shapiro. Uh, who later was the Rashiv and Beryakov, he studied for a time in Lamjan Petach Tikva. Reb Meisha Salavechik, who started off in Brisk, and then he ran away to escape the Polish draft with his friend Reb Aaron Leib Steinman. He was, Reb Meisha Salavechik was the son of, of Reb Yisrael Gershon Salavechik, the oldest son of Reb Chaim Brisker. And the two, these two friends escaped to uh, Switzerland, to, and they studied in the Montreux, 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 however you pronounce these uh, these cities' names in the yeshiva there in Switzerland, and after the war, they came to um, to uh, Palestine. So Rameshe Salavechik studied for a time in Lamji Yeshiva, and those are all leaders, the Torah leaders who passed away. But Yibad Chaim, Reb Gershon Edelstein, the Rashiva in Panovish, and Reb Chaim Kanievsky uh, studied uh, products really of of the uh, especially Reb Chaim Kanievsky, because Reb Gershon Edelstein later on went to Panovish. Reb Chaim Kanievsky was really a, his. Basically, his, his main yeshiva, pretty much his only yeshiva, was was Lamja, Lamja and Petach Tikva. The latter, Reb Chaim Kanievsky, uh, actually settled there in in uh, Petach Tikva, there following his marriage for a short period of time to be near the yeshiva. Um, so he actually lived there for, for a time before he returned to Bnei Brak, which would you know be very interesting because uh, he became so synonymous with 
with uh, Rehov Rashbam and everything, so we could imagine if if the whole situation going on there would have been in Petach Tikva, it would be a whole, an entirely different experience. Um, so what we have is the rise of the Lamja in Petach Tikva, but then there's this, this uh, decline in the 1960s, and there's, it can be attributed to several factors. Some of them are quite obvious. Rabbi Chil Michal Gordon, the main Rosh Yeshiva, who I spoke about at length in part one, um, Reb Ruvain Katz, the rabbi of Petach Tikva, who was heavily involved in the yeshiva, and the day-to-day active Rosh Yeshiva, Rabbi Moshe Leib Eiser, all passed away within a few years of each other in the 1960s. So there's this leadership vacuum, and then there's the young Rabbi Eliezer Eiser, who comes and fills it in, and he builds up the kail. but again, it was the whole uh, previous generation who, who passed away. That was one factor that uh, caused its decline. There was also the rise of Panovish. Um... The Panovich is founded in the 1940s, but until it becomes prominent, it takes well over a decade. It takes a, into the 1950s for it to become a major player on the scene. So, you know, Lamj and Petach Tikva was around since 1926. So they're already 30 years. Uh, uh, they're around for that long by the time Panovich becomes, fa- becomes a big factor. So it took a, uh, another few years for Panovich to catch up. But by the 1960s, Panovich had replaced... Um, the Lamja as the premier yeshiva in that area. Um, again, the geography-wise, I hope, hope most of the listeners are familiar, but Petach Tikva and B'nai Brak are, ne- are next to each other, right? In fact, Tel Aviv, Givatayim, Ramat Gan, B'nai Brak, uh, uh, Petach Tikva, and about 12 other cities are all next to each other, uh, literally next to each other. That's why also so much traffic and nowhere to park. And uh, that's the Merkaz, the, the center of the country. That's just to, to clarify that, just to understand why, why, the, why the two yeshivas had an influence. And there are other factors as well, and which uh, uh, I'm not going to get into. And, and this all led to its decline. Um, so then what remained for it afterwards was a kail, which continues until today. And uh, that's, uh, that's the history of Lamja. So this is Yehuda Geber with Jewish History Soundbites. You can reach me at Yehuda at YehudaGeber.com for questions, comments, sources, tours, trips, uh, uh, sponsorships, and lectures. You can subscribe to Jewish History Soundbites on Podbean or your favorite podcast platform. Follow us on Twitter at JSoundbites, and I hope you enjoyed.